Uh, but we're going to talk a little bit about uh, apostolic doctrine and demonstration. And we're going to go through some verses in your handout there. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, uh, as we begin here, sometimes um, when we talk about apostolic authority, when we're talking about, you know, apostolic, we're talking about that which we see in the apostles' lives, that which we see in the early church. And we want that to carry over into our lives. Um, there are those that don't believe that uh, the demonstration of the apostles is for today, that it has ceased, that it has ended. And uh, that would be a, quite an unfortunate way to live, uh, to think that, you know, all the fun stuff, the exciting stuff, the great stuff, the powerful stuff can happen in the beginning, but God's church progressively gets colder, weaker, lamer, more boring. Uh, that would be, that'd be a difficult way to live, but I suppose people do it. Um, but I'm thankful that we can read the scriptures and we see that there's nothing that indicates that miracles, signs, and wonders have ceased. The only indication we see is that the day will come where there will not be a need for the miraculous because all things will come into authority under the uh, the footstool of Jesus Christ, everything under submission. There's not going to be need of remission of sins. There's not going to be need of healing of bodies because Jesus Christ will become all in all. And so when we read here, as we're going through this, you know, we talk about doctrine and we talk about demonstration. And there are those that lean one way over the other more heavily. But it's not a competition to see what's more important, demonstration or doctrine. It should be both and. Just like the Bible says in the book of John chapter 1, it talks about grace and truth. It's not one over the other. It's both and. Now, I suppose we can say, and it is true, that doctrine is the most important. Truth is the most important. But it is not to pick one and basically camp out there and avoid the other out of fear. We don't have to fear grace, and we don't have to fear demonstration. We need to be in the truth. We need to be in the doctrine. But we should believe that in this doctrine, in this truth, comes demonstration, comes grace, comes miracle signs and wonders. But when we read here in the opening of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, uh, I, I really love this portion of Scripture as Paul is admonishing the church. He starts to talk here, and he says, The preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. Now, we as, as church folks, we get excited about the cross. We get excited, uh, you know, when we have worship service and we're singing about the cross and we're into the preaching of the Word. We get excited about that. But not everybody gets excited because it's foolish, it's silly, it's weird, it's awkward to this world. And so Paul says, unto us which are saved, we realize this is the power of God. And so the lost, people that are not right with God, people that are not saved, they are at a loss for this method of the message. This God chose this method. God chose this venue. God chose this vehicle to present the gospel. Now, God can also let the gospel be shared through other venues as well. I've seen some pretty awesome stuff happen in a skit, a skit or in a play or in a worship service where there was not technically a preacher that stood in a pulpit and began to open his Bible and preach the Word of God, but the Spirit of God was operating through the worship, and the Spirit of God was operating in, say, a, a play, theatrics, and all of a sudden there is a communication of the Spirit to that soul, to that individual, and they repent and they get filled with the Holy Ghost, God can use any vehicle. But more times than often, God has favored, God has selected in these last times, as it says in Titus chapter 1, the preaching. God chose the preaching to bring forth this message of the gospel. And so Paul says the world thinks it's crazy, but we must accept this and embrace this reality. Verse 19 through 21, It is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? After that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom 
knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Again, God chose the vehicle, the method of preaching to save the lost. And it confounds the wise. It confuses them. They can't figure out what in the world that this is the way uh, that I should be. Why should I be that? It just seems so base. It seems so um, uh, not intellectual. It seems ignorant. Why would I come down from my pedestal of my education? Why would I come down from my well-mannered behavior and get to that posture where I'm laid prostrate at an altar praying? Why would I listen to some man that doesn't know more than me when it comes to some sort of SAT or ACT type test? Why would I submit myself to that when I'm smarter than that person? But God chose this way. And God has chose a foolish method. It would be foolish for us to choose another method. Uh, It it was talked about quite often in many um, events in times past. I don't hear it discussed as much. But basically, when they would talk about a seeker-friendly church, there was this big push to basically remove the weird and the awkward from a service to basically make it more inviting and welcoming to a guest that would come so they would not feel out of place, but they would feel right at home right away. Now, that's not to say that we want to make people feel stupid. It's not that to say that we want people to feel absolutely, totally, completely uncomfortable where they feel not no longer welcome here. But they, they, there should be something about somebody that comes to a place that preaches the Word of God where there is something out of place, that they recognize something is off. Now, they may not connect the dots correctly, but something should be off because there is something off. It is an eternal uh, distance. It's an eternal chasm that basically this person that comes to the house of God, yes, should be warmed, welcome, friendly, welcome to the house of God. Hey, have a seat here. This is how service goes, some instruction, things of that nature. Paul goes on when you read in chapter uh, 12 and in chapter 14 of Corinthians, Paul begins to explain to the church, he says, look, This is how we ought to have church conducted because there will be people coming in and we want them to know this is what's going on. This is what is happening. But ultimately, if you really are an apostolic church in doctrine and in demonstration, somebody that is not familiar with the doctrine, somebody that is not familiar with spirit demonstration, they're going to feel out of place. They're going to feel uncomfortable. They're going to feel a disconnect. But the Spirit, I believe, will draw them. The Bible says nobody can come to God except the Spirit draws them. Yes, we're going to vacuum the church. We're going to clean the church. We're going to have greeters at the door. We're going to have a time of fellowship between services downstairs. We're going to do everything we can to try to bridge the gap. But ultimately, we cannot try to mask, cover, or remove doctrine and demonstration of the Spirit. Because that's the only thing that's going to liberate somebody and save somebody. And so we go on here. We don't have to make excuses for his ways. And unfortunately, we can get embarrassed about the way we operate in church at times. And I will say this. It is natural. It is normal for you to feel uncomfortable, a nervous sweat, especially if you bring a friend or family member to church yourself. Because they're connecting you, your person, your, your, everything about you to this church. And so when you walk into a building, you have a guest, you have a friend, or maybe you'd even bring somebody, but you're sitting in service and you're just having the time of your life with Jesus. And then, you know, they say, turn your head, turn your head, shake your uh, hand, uh, shake hands with somebody. And all of a sudden, right behind you, uh, came in late, your coworker, and you're like, oh my goodness. They just heard me speak in tongues. They just saw me waving my hands back and forth, and I'm usually cool, calm, and collective at the workplace. Yes, your flesh will feel uncomfortable. Yes, you'll feel kind of embarrassed, but we must not try to make excuses for God. Remember, God chose this. God could have chose any method he would have sovereign. He had sovereign right to choose anything he wanted, but God chose the lifting of hands. 
God chose the lifting of the voice. God chose leaping. God chose dancing. God chose praise. God chose worship. God chose the foolishness of preaching. God chose speaking in other tongues. And so as much as it makes our flesh uncomfortable, we just have to be comfortable with this fact. God is God. I am not. God chose this. And so I'm going to trust this. I'm going to submit myself to it. And I'm going to believe that the person that is in this room, that God brought them here. And this is the opportunity for me to demonstrate what is apostolic and for me to support what is apostolic doctrine and get behind it. So whoever comes here knows that there is agreement here. There is a belief here. And so we go on here in 1 Corinthians verse 22. It says, the Jews require a sign. Greeks seek after wisdom. And so there's different people wired different ways that uh, uh, go about things differently. But we, the church, what we do is we preach. We're going to preach Jesus crucified, and it might be a stumbling block to a certain camp. It might be foolishness to another camp. But if somebody is called of God, if somebody is wanting to serve God, they will recognize this is Christ the power of God, and this is the wisdom of God. Jesus said it like this, my sheep hear my voice. And so, say this foolish behavior is going on from the pulpit, from the platform, or in service, in the audience, whatever. And yes, we may feel uncomfortable because someone's going to think it's foolish. Somebody's going to think it's, you know, it's going to be offensive to them. It's going to be a stumbling block to them. But those that are hungry, those that want to be saved, and those that God is reaching for, the Bible says they will come to the conclusion, this is Christ, the power of God. That's what this is. That's why we ought not to back up in our praise. That's why we ought not to back up in the preaching. We need to praise God, and we need to preach the word of God, because if somebody really is being called of God in this place, they will come to the conclusion, God is here. God is in this place, and I want what they have. It may not make sense to me currently, but I know eventually I will get to that place that I see that that man over there or that lady over there. They look like they have joy on them. They look like they have liberty on I want what they have. And so we must be the people of the doctrine and demonstration of what we read about in the word of the Lord. And so we go on reading here in verse 25, the foolishness of God is wiser than men. Now, we can think of the best way to have church, but ultimately God, as crazy as some of his methods seem to be, it's smarter than our method. It's better than our method. And the weakness of God is stronger than men. So you see your calling, brethren, how not many wise after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. And so ultimately, self-sufficient people rarely find themselves in need of a Savior. It's somebody that is at their wit's end. It's somebody that's broken. It's somebody that is desperate. It is somebody that they've tried doing it every which way to make it work, realizing the conclusion is it doesn't work. I need this thing called Jesus. I need this thing called the church. I, I, I need this Holy Ghost. I need this foolishness of preaching. I need the foolishness of God. I need the weakness of God because it's stronger than I am. It's wiser than I am. And so we have to see our calling, and we are called to be dependent and in need. The moment we become independent and the moment we become self-sufficient, you know, the, the things of church and the things of the preaching and the things in the altar and the things in worship service, they seem silly to us. They seem trivial to us. They seem, you know, backwards to us. But when I'm desperate, I'll do anything. I'll do anything. When, when, when I am dependent, I will do anything my master says. I, whatever he wants, I want to give it to him and then some. This is our reasonable service. Verse 27 God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things that are mighty. Just recognize you're a part of something that is foolish, and you're a part of something that is weak in the world's eyes. And so we ought not to be caught off guard when somebody comes and they think these things about us. 
In fact, if they think these things about us, you know, maybe we should take courage that, okay, I guess I am in apostolic heritage. I am continuing the apostles' doctrine. The base things of the world, the things which are despised, God has chosen. Once more, if you look at today in this 21st century, we are a part of something that this world absolutely despises. It cannot stand the church. It hates the church. And uh, one thing we ought to continue to do, as the word of the Lord declares to do, is pray for our government. Pray for our officials that we can lead peaceable lives, that we can exercise the liberties that we have. Now, the church is not confined to the governments of this world. We continue doing what we do, but it sure is nice to be able to assemble together freely and openly. Where you take other places in, in this same country, such as California, that there is an obvious, an obvious difference in the way the government handles the church than it does any other facet of society in their state. And so I, I, I constantly get these updates from Brother Hodges. He, he, se- he sends this text, and uh, it, it's, it's absolutely crazy what they have to go through just to try to assemble. And he'll constantly he'll send pictures of all these other assemblies in other places, going to like Costco, going to Trader Joe's, going to uh, this event, that event, or a riot or outdoor festivity, and people completely clustered together. But you cannot do that in the name of church, or you will get arrested. You will get fined. And so we here today, we recognize that the world despises what we do, but I'm thankful that there are certain places, there are pockets on this planet where the government still favors the church. The government still has acts of kindness for the church. And so I would encourage us, let's continue to pray for our governor. Let's continue to pray for officials. They're not going to get things perfect. They're not going to get things right every time. But, man, I am thankful. I am thankful that this entire pandemic we have been able to exercise freely in this place, in this community. And I'm thankful that we've been able to let God lead us in our decisions that we have made. And so the Bible goes on to say here, in verse 29, the purpose that God does all of this is that no flesh should glory in his presence. The church is about God's presence. This is about the Lord himself. And we're, we're not going to see the grace of God if we don't make space for God. And we, we we're, again, we're going to do everything as nice as we can. And you, you, if you know me, you know that I, I've made strides and effort to make sure that, you know, the church looks presentable, the church looks nice. We may have differences in taste of style and all that kind of stuff or methods and approaches. But ultimately, I want the church to look nice. I want people to feel like this is a clean place. If you've ever walked into a restaurant to get something to eat, and then you go to the restroom, and then all of a sudden you just kind of change your mind. You're like, man, this restroom's like dirty. I don't think I want to eat here. There's people who think that way, and they come into the house of God, and they can tell whether the people of this property care about it. So I'm all about taking care of it. But it cannot become our obsession where we become so obsessed where it pretty much dictates our emotions on how things are done or how things are presented or uh, the color scheme or the whatever, where it gets so ingrained in our mind that when we come, that's the focal point, and we no longer have space for the grace of God to move. God didn't choose color schemes to save the lost. God didn't choose pews or chairs to save the lost. God didn't choose overhead projection or digital projection. God didn't choose those methods to save the lost. We'll use any method we can to project the gospel, but ultimately we need to make space for God's grace to move in his house. Someone say amen. And so when we operate God's way, there's no way that we get the credit. And uh, I'm sure you've been a part of the service, and I could, if we sat here and, you know, had, you know, karaoke here and passed the microphone around, we could share a moment where a service did not go the way that we would like to have had it gone. But it seems to be God chooses those moments to help us to be reminded that he's God. He saves, he redeems, he restores, he delivers, he does the miraculous. And I, 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 could, and I could think back on services where I thought, 
man, I don't know what's going on. What in the world? Or, you know, this is off or the, the projection's not working or the sound's not working. And all of a sudden after service, you know, when the conclusion, somebody gets filled with the Holy Ghost or somebody comes up to me afterwards and tells how God healed them of cancer. God healed them of this, that, or the other. And that, 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 that has actually occurred in this church here in Watertown. Moments where, like, it's just like, what in the world? But God says, look, this is not about your flesh getting any credit getting any glory, God will get the glory at the end of the day. And so the way the church survives and grows leaves the world and leaves our flesh, our humanity, speechless, really, because uh, I, 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 you think about society today, you know, what is promoted, what is sold, what's at the forefront, what I have no idea what the number one song is or what the number one movie is right now. I could Google it and I could read through the lyrics or read, you know, the the outline of the movie script. But I would venture to say it's probably counter biblical. I'm just if I was a guessing man, I would guess the number one song. Maybe don't don't look it up right now. But the number one song probably has something to do with sex or drugs or anti authority. It has something to do that is basically counter biblical. And it, it, it's amazing that how, how this society really is anti-Christ. It is anti-God. We're, we're, we're on that pathway where church, the liberties that we have right now are not going to be there. They're going to be removed. We're not that far off. I don't know if it's 10 years. I don't know if it's 30 years if the Lord tarries. I'm not sure. But man, things really are moving at an accelerated rate. And the older you are, the more you recognize that. And I'm 36 years old, and it's apparent to me that in the past 10 years, in the past five years, the agenda of society has escalated and accelerated at an onslaught and a pace that the church, it almost seems like it can't keep up with it. But what's amazing to me is as anti-God as our society is, when I talk to churches and when I visit places, districts are growing. Churches are growing. Revival is happening. And um, I, I, it was at the minister's retreat, I think a year or two ago, when uh, uh, Daryl Weber came to South Dakota, and he began to share all the statistics of what's going on with the apostolic church worldwide. There are more people that are speaking in tongues, baptized in Jesus' name, than at any other point in history. There are more people getting the Holy Ghost in a day across this world than there's ever been in the entire existence of this world. It's amazing to me that the foolishness, uh, uh, God chose this foolish method. And in this dark day, the church seems to keep growing and to keep moving, just like it was on the day of the birth of the church in that uh, first window that it opened up was persecution did not stop the church. The religious order of that day did not stop the church. It kept growing. And I believe that that is where we are at. The church is a whole worldwide, but I believe here as a church locally that it is the will of God in the face of darkness, in the face of anything we come up against, that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. We don't have to make excuses for God. We don't have to try to figure everything out to uh, to try to manipulate growth. But God's going to give the increase. If you uh, know Pastor Paul Connor from Tucson, Arizona, is just an amazing man. I, I remember him sharing this story. If you ever heard him preach the sermon, where's the M&M's? And uh, it kind of seems like an interesting sermon to preach. But long story short, and I might ruin it for you, but uh, if, you, if you happen to be somewhere where he preaches it. But if you don't want me to ruin it for you, just plug your ears. But basically, he, he, shares, he shares the story of him and his family going to the M&M factory, wherever they make M&M's. And they go through the whole thing, the whole tour, and afterwards they go to the gift shop, and uh, all of a sudden he's just craving M&Ms. I don't know why you'd crave M&Ms at an M&M factory, but he's craving them, right? And so he goes to buy M&Ms, and there literally are no M&Ms for sale in the M&M factory. Here, here is everything M&M, but you can't even get M&Ms in this setting. And the, the, the point he draws out is basically, you know, you, you can have a factory called the church pushing out everything. And people come into that factory called the church and not find what the church is producing called the Spirit of God. 
And that's not what we want to be. We don't want to be a church that basically says, you know, we're, we're the church. We're the church, the presence of God, and they come and there's no God. That's not what we want to be. And so, but he, and here's another point that he makes in it. This is why I mentioned the story. is that He was in a setting with, with the general board, uh, uh, with a church growth strategy team, and, and they basically laid out a list of the top however many growing churches in the world. This is what they have in their church. And he starts reading down the list, you know, and I, I'm just making some stuff up, you know, the most pristine porcelain on the planet and uh, uh, the most vacuum sanctuary and, you know, a nice aroma uh, when you walk in, the friendly greeters. It's just going down the list of these are what the top growing churches have. And so he's looking at it, and basically he's like, okay, uh, we failed there. Okay, we, or no, 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 sorry. He goes, we succeed there. Check, 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 check. And basically the entire list, his, his church passed the test. But then he started thinking about, as they're talking about growing churches, he's like, well, our church isn't growing. Like, we're not having a revival. We're not having growth. But then all of a sudden this thought came to his mind, and he's thinking about their church plant that's just over the border in Mexico that's having explosive growth and explosive revival. And he looks at that list, and it failed every single check mark. Nothing was getting passed. There wasn't, you know, the projection system. There wasn't the, you know, the, the, the pristine bathrooms, all this kind of stuff. But one passed the test, one failed the test. But one wasn't growing, and one was growing. At the, that, again, that's not communicating we don't care about the presentation. But it does communicate this, that God gives the increase. We cannot manufacture church in a fashion and way where we think that we have this sort of formula that's going to produce X, Y, Z. We got to make sure that there's praying, that there's fasting, and that there's a reliance and complete total dependence on the Lord Jesus Christ to give the increase. And so we keep moving forward here. Uh, chapter 2, verse 1, he says, when I came to you, uh, and he's talking about his first moments with the Corinth people starting that church. He says, look, it wasn't with the excellency of speech. It wasn't with wisdom. When I declared to you the testimony of God, I made up my mind not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And he starts getting transparent. He goes, look, I'll be honest with you. I was in weakness. I was in fear. And I was in much trembling. See, Paul did not rely on ability. Everything he relied on was deity. It was God. God is what made that church plant. God is what made that church grow. And we should be weak so he can be strong. We need to stay humble, stay low, and say, God, without you, we can do nothing. It is impossible without your presence. Chapter 2, verse 4 goes on saying, My speech, my preaching, wasn't with enticing words of man's wisdom. It was in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. And so we need to be apostolic in doctrine and in demonstration. There was this element of Paul in his preaching, in his teaching, in his doctrine, that there was it was coupled with demonstration. And this is important for us to take note of and to uh, hopefully be inspired because this demonstration, it opened the door to impartation of that doctrine. Many times Jesus and the apostles were able to teach doctrine because of a miracle or after a miracle. Now, a miracle, it doesn't guarantee a conversion. But it it certainly does make an impact, and it certainly does open the door for conversation. But there are times where Jesus performed the miracle in front of everyone, and then they kicked him out. He performed the miracle that was just huge, and then they try to throw him over a cliff. So demonstration is not a guarantee to conversion. But demonstration does open a door many times to impartation of that doctrine that we want to give. You want to know by what means? This man has been made whole. Let it be made known to you that at the name of Jesus, this man has been made whole. And neither is there salvation in any other because there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It was the miracle. It was a demonstration that opened the door for the impartation of doctrine. Now, there wasn't a conversion with that group that asked the question, but 
There was the peripheral that was converted. There was many that believed that day because of the miracle. And those that did not convert could not refute what performed in front of them. They could say nothing when they saw the man, they saw the apostles, and they knew that they'd been with Jesus. And so we can't just write off demonstrate. Well, you know, you know, church is not just about demonstration. We know doctrine, teaching. You know. Yes, but man, don't you want to have both? Wouldn't you like to see both? I want to try to go as many avenues possible to reach as many people as possible. Verse 5, your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And so our faith, it needs to be based on God, not on a personality. And Paul deals with this, and we, we could spend time there, we're not going to. But when, when you read in chapter 1, in chapter 2, and chapter 3, he's building this point. Saying, stop name dropping Paul, Cephas, and Apollos. You're into this personality-based, you know, church thing. You're into this personality-based uh, uh, movement. And he says, it's not about a personality. It's about God. And he says, remember how this church was started. It was started in humility. It was started in trembling. It was started in ignorance. It was God who gave the increase. Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24, thus saith the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glory glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord that exercises loving kindness, judgment, righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, says the Lord. We must never rely on our wisdom, strength, or wealth as the means to have revival. God wants us to glory in what we know and understand about him. Oh, that I might know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. I want to apprehend that which has apprehended me. And so God, he is the one that will exercise the growth. Our job is to plant and water. But there are, there are methods of planting and watering agriculture that are more effective than others. We do have to recognize that as well. And so we go to the book of Isaiah. I love when it, it breaks down basically the farming illustration. I believe it's Isaiah 54. Uh, might be 52, but either way. Um, Zechariah 4, 6. I've got to hurry up to a close here. He answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. The miraculous can occur when our might and power are out of the way. You know, we could keep trying to do it our way with all of our might and all of our power, but it is, it's by His Spirit. It's by His Spirit. We need God to demonstrate, to confirm the Word with signs following. Was that not the prayer of the early church? And that was that not how Jesus sent them out? He sent them out before He ascended into heaven saying, look, Look, I'm going to go with you. I'll be with you to the ends of the earth. And the Bible says that God confirmed the word with signs. The word is the doctrine. The signs are the demonstration. And God is the one that confirms the doctrine with signs following. I believe, I don't have it down here, but I believe it's 2 Corinthians 12, 12, when Paul says it like this, he says, the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in mighty, many mighty deeds. And he says there, there is a sign, there is a confirmation um, to the doctrine. Verse 31 says, to covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet I show you a more excellent way. That's when it gets into love, the love chapter, because some people will use this to write off desiring the gifts of the Spirit. As they see, it's not really about that. It's about love. And yes, love matters, but the point is that God, or the Bible, it strongly forbids coveting. You know, the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not covet. But this is the one time that God tells us to covet or to desire. And so we need to desire the supernatural. And to, to answer that argument or how someone would refute desiring the gifts, saying, well, it's not about gifts, it's about love. Yes, we know that love is the core, but the gifts are the extension. They should be the extension of the motive. They should be the extension of a church that loves and is filled with the love of God. But he goes on to say this. In verse 1 of uh, uh, chapter 14, right after the love chapter, he says, yes, follow charity and desire spiritual gifts. And then he says, rather that ye may prophesy. 
Basically, there's that clear communication. He says there's the demonstration and the doctrine. You need to have that inspired speaking, but you also need to have the demonstration of the gifts of the Spirit as well. So we need to reach for everything that is available. I want to reach for everything available. 1 Timothy 3, one, and we're wrapping up here. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of, of a bishop, he desireth a good work. What I like to state from here is that we need to desire promotion. I don't I don't want to stay at an entry level position. Now I'm not talking about literal position of an office of, you know, well, you know, I'm this department head, I'm that department head, you know. I'm just talking about excelling in the things of God. However we enter into this, I want to grow in this. I want to grow in the grace. You know, now obviously, Paul is speaking to Timothy, if, if a man desires the office of the bishop, he desires a good thing. And so he's, he's, not, he's not trying to drown out anyone's passion that has a desire for the work of God. Now, just because someone desires something doesn't mean they get to get it. Because it, there is this thing called the call of God, you know, that there's that, that whole thing. But he's not discouraging anyone from wanting more of God. And that should be something inside of us. I, this is, I, yes, I'm a saint of God, but I, I want more of God. I want to know, I want to be used more. I'm thankful to be a part of this and have the doctrine, but I want to have, the, if you lack the gifts of demonstration of, say, miracles, signs, and wonders in that arena, it's okay to have a desire for it. Don't be discouraged from it because we just read two verses, chapter 12, verse 31, and chapter 14, verse 1. Covet earnestly the best gifts and desire spiritual gifts. Paul sandwiches the love chapter with desiring the gifts of the Spirit. He's talking to the entire assembly. He's talking to the entire church. There should be something inside of you that says, man, I, w- I would like, I want to be used in that capacity. God, let me be used in that capacity. The supernatural is available to those who make themselves available. Why not go after it? It's for you. It's for all of us. There's, we are baptized into one body by one spirit. And so how... This question, I'll never forget this question that was asked in a minister's retreat uh, by Brother Strout. This is about maybe five years ago, four years ago. I don't remember exactly how long. But he asked the question, how long would it take to count to a billion? And if you were to literally count to a billion, like a second being the value of a second, it would take 31 years, 251 days, 46 minutes, and 40 seconds to count to a billion. Or if you want to round up, it takes 32 years. If you wanted to count to a billion, it would take you 32 years. How long would it count, uh, take to count to 7 billion? 224 years. And what he was trying to help us to understand in that moment, it takes a lot to count that high. And think about this, that there are 7.6 billion people on this planet. And if it takes 224 years just to count to 7 billion, how, how much longer would it take for us in our own efforts to reach 7.5 billion people? It's not possible. This is why we need the miraculous. It takes the miraculous for 7.6 billion people to hear the gospel. It's going to take the miraculous for multitudes to be converted. Yes, Disciple, be one, make one. That's the most effective model is to work one-on-one with somebody and instill into somebody and build somebody. And I encourage you, work with one person a year. Build one person a year. You don't have to try to impress the church with, oh, look, I, I, I brought 80 people to church. That's fantastic. But build one person. Build one person. But also remember this. We don't know how much longer we have. As you're reaching for one person, we need demonstration. We need the miraculous if we're ever going to reach the multitudes. Because there's 21,452 people in Watertown, South Dakota. We need demonstration if we're going to reach a multitude. Let's stand together. God, we love you. 
We thank you for your word. We thank you for your truth. And I pray, God, that you would put inside of us a desire, a passion, yes, for the doctrine. We need apostolic doctrine. It's where we're rooted. It's where we're grounded. But, God, I ask and I pray that you would grant unto us, Lord, the desires of our heart for apostolic demonstration. Lord, we need the sign of the Holy Ghost, miracle signs and wonders, Lord, to open up that door so we can give the doctrine. Lord, that the only way for people to be saved. In the name of Jesus, I pray you'd anoint us and favor us. In Jesus' name, 